So the Fed is the central bank of the United States. Part of their functions are to print bills, set monetary policy, set short-term interest rates, and their two primary mandates are to maximize employment and achieve price stability. Thanks for listening to IBKR's Sense Security. As always, there's more content at ibkrpodcast.com. And if you're interested in learning more about interactive brokers, visit ibkr.com. We offer more trading education content such as webinars, market commentary, market-related courses, and quant-related articles at ibkrcampus.com. Welcome back to Sense of Security podcast. I'm Cassidy Clement, Senior Manager of SEO and Content at Interactive Brokers. Today, I'm your host for our podcast, and our guest is Jose Torres, Interactive Brokers Senior Economist. We're going to discuss the Fed. The Federal Reserve, or the Fed, has a big impact on the economics of the U.S. and its banking system. So how exactly does this impact everyday investors? Well, we're going to find out. So welcome back to the program, Jose. Hi, Cassidy. Great to be here. Thanks for having me again. Sure. So to kick off for our listeners, what exactly is the Fed? What are their common functions? Sure. So the Fed is the central bank of the United States. Um, Part of their functions are to print bills, set monetary policy, set short-term interest rates, and their two primary mandates are to maximize employment and achieve price stability, which they define as the core PCE price index rising 2% year over year. They also do some bank regulation as well. So they are the ones who conduct the monetary policy for our country or for the United States, correct? Yes. And then with the big events that everyone talks about, usually like the Fed meetings. So how many times a year are there are they meeting? And do we know ahead of time when these are going to be and how quickly they're going to happen? Yes, absolutely. They meet eight times a year for an interest rate decision. Uh, Those dates are known well in advance. For example, today we have all the dates for 2024. Um, Four times a year, they release the summary of economic projections. They also called as also called the SEP or the dot plot. And that provides market participants with forecasts of where the Fed sees several different indicators. So economic growth is one, unemployment is another, inflation is another, and of course, the federal funds rate, where they forecast the federal funds rate to be. Uh, And and those insights are particularly important, um, especially if you're early in March and you're looking to see where the Fed thinks rates will be by year end. Uh, And the dot plot is released typically at the end of each quarter. So uh, at the the March meeting, at the June meeting, at the September meeting, and then at the December meeting. So when we're talking about the Fed, or if you're listening to commentary, reading about it, etc., usually there's a lot of common financial jargon involved, or I will say you'll see it very often the second you search for the Fed or you're reading about them, so it will become common very quickly. So I kind of have a lightning round-ish scenario here where I'm going to go down the line for like five, six, seven maybe terms, and could you give our listeners kind of like the bullet point explanations of these? Sure. Awesome. So let's start with the first one. What is monetary policy? So monetary policy is essentially setting interest rates and whatever bond buying or bond selling program a central bank is engaging in. So another set of terms that we recently did a podcast on is the difference of inflation versus deflation. How would you explain that? (laughs) Sure. So inflation means prices are increasing. Deflation means prices are decreasing. And I'll add one more to that. Disinflation means that the pace of inflation is slowing down. So disinflation means that you still have inflation, prices are still increasing, albeit at a slower rate. 
deflation is when prices are outright declining. What about hawkish versus a dovish Fed policy? This is one of my favorites because um, I like animals. Uh, so um, the hawks tend to be folks that have a bias towards more tightening, where as the doves have a bias towards less tightening, right? So oftentimes, whenever there's disagreement amongst the committee members, uh, you know, the market participants are always wondering, well, who are the hawks and who are the doves? You know, um, like in, the, in today's Fed, for example, um, Harker from Philadelphia tends to be dovish, whereas um, Waller or Kashkari they tend to be more hawkish. So there's always, you know, market players like to think about it like that, like which ones are the hawkish ones and which ones are the dovish ones. And in aggregate, where is that going to shift monetary policy? And that's also in terms of interest rates, correct? So it's like a tighter interest rate or like a higher interest rate versus a more of a lower policy, right? So the dovish would be lower where the hawkish is higher, correct? Absolutely, yes. So what's the difference when you hear these two terms, Federal Reserve versus FOMC? Um, so so the, Fed, the FOMC is the um, Federal Open Market Committee. Uh, and, you know, it, it refers to the folks that are voting in, at the Fed meeting. So what happens is that um, some regional presidents, they have voting rights sometimes, but not all the time. So, for example, the New York Fed president, Williams, he votes all the time. Um, but some of the other ones aren't voting members all the time. So they'll, they'll be like, I'm not sure exactly how long the terms are, but they'll be voting for a year or two and then not voting for a year or two like that. The board members always vote and the New York Fed president always votes. The other ones rotate. So the biggest phrase that um, next to probably monetary policy that comes out of any change in policy usually is the Fed funds rate blank, either increased or decreased. What exactly is the Fed funds rate or federal funds rate? And how exactly is this looked at? Is it is it reevaluated every couple weeks? How, how exactly does it work? Sure. So it's reevaluated at each meeting and then a decision is made, which is then announced to the public on the second day of the meeting at 2 p.m. Then the chair comes out at 2.30 and um, has a presentation on economic conditions and a QA. and uh, In terms of what it is and how it affects the economy, it's the rate on short-term cash uh, and mainly the overnight bank rate. So if a bank needs cash, for example, how what's the rate that that bank needs to pay to get cash in their doors on an overnight basis? So what happens is that as short-term rates increase, the medium-term and long-term rates increase as well. So that's kind of how the tightening gets dispersed across the entire economy. First, short-term with the Fed, and then ultimately that tightens financial conditions and works its way across the yield curve. And then it starts affecting Treasury bonds at the five-year, 10-year duration. Uh, it starts affecting mortgages, starts affecting car loans, credit card uh, interest rates, all kinds of interest rates. But it starts with that overnight rate that tightens liquidity at the short end and then spreads across the yield curve. Where can some people who are starting investors or just, you know, everyday listeners, where can they see the Fed's impact in their everyday life. I mean, I know the Fed funds rate will impact all types of investment because it impacts market sentiment. But usually, where are the key areas that um, the average adult is going to see the Fed impact their life or their finances? So by increasing the federal funds rate, the average adult can park money in financial institutions and gain a higher rate. So for example, I'd invite listeners who don't already have an interactive brokerage account to open one because we're paying up to 4.83% on idle cash, right? So that's one way that folks are affected by higher rates is through their savings. Now, on the borrowing side, you know, that's where they're negatively affected, right? If they want to buy a property, it's going to be more expensive. If they want to buy an automobile, it's going to be more expensive. And 
all the kinds of goods that are usually purchased with financing, like furniture or microwaves, refrigerators, ovens, you know, those heavy household goods become much more expensive to finance at those higher rates. So when these uh, rate decisions come out, is there any general trend um, of impact on the stock market? Like if a rate goes up, does sentiment usually change or prices change? And in what way? Sure. So typically, the market kind of knows what's going to happen at the Fed meeting. Um, however, there are a lot of cases where there's a 50-50 split. And in those cases, when the Fed chooses the hawkish 50, so in the case, for example, in 2022, prior to some meetings, we didn't know if it was going to be 75 or 50. Those were even odds, coin flip odds. In the cases where they chose fifth, uh, in the cases where they chose 75, excuse me, that led to stock prices going down, investor sentiment to sour, and to bond yield, for bond yields to go higher. So yeah, generally speaking, if the Fed surprises to the upside with rates, that's bad for financial assets. Prices go down. If they surprise to the downside with rates, then generally speaking, that is bullish for financial assets. The stock prices go up and bond yields go down and bond prices go up. So when these meetings or these changes occur, are there certain indicators that investors should look for in the market or from, let's say, these meeting recaps? I know you and some of our other commentators write recaps on the meeting or the ripple effects of what happens after the meeting. What should investors be looking for? Investors should be looking at so many things during a Fed meeting, right? Um, Particularly when the dot plot gets updated, That's integral because it tells market players where the Fed sees things going in the next few months and how that's going to guide monetary policy. But one of the main things also is the commentary from the Fed chair, right? How is the Fed chair speaking? Is he pushing back hard against questions or is he acquiescing to the crowd? What's the tone? Is the tone hawkish? Is the tone dovish? You know, and that's kind of how, similar to when listening to company earnings calls, that can be very beneficial to investors. Listening to Fed, the Fed conference and the Fed presentation is also important from a macroeconomic perspective. And I would say those are some important considerations. So going one step further, because we're talking about something that's U.S. centric, do other countries or other economies really pay attention to the Fed? Or is that something a little bit more you know, part of our hometown, if you will, or, you know, very national instead of international. Are other parties really paying attention to those meetings and these decisions? Absolutely. You know, the, the, the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency. And to the extent that Treasury yields increase because the Fed is on a hawkish path, what that actually does is that it brings money from overseas into the U.S. Treasury. Because when the U.S. is paying a high rate of interest, that is theoretically risk-free. And we, we like to think about treasuries as risk-free instruments. And then we can price all other assets with that consideration in mind. So if someone is inve- has a, an emerging market investment that is going to pay 10% per year with risk, they may not make that investment if treasury bonds are paying 5.5% because they're saying, why should I take that risk to get paid 10 when I can get paid five and a half here without taking risk? But if treasury bonds are 1%, then that investor is incrementally incentivized to take that 10% investment. So that's what happens is when rates go higher, money actually leaves a lot of the emerging markets and they get they go, they go to treasury bonds because of the higher risk free yields. Uh, again, we have the reserve currency of the world and another thing the dollar increases when rates are higher for that reason right because of those capital inflows the dollar becomes more valuable Uh, and then that starts to negatively affect exports because foreign countries have a more difficult time um, paying up in u.s dollars when the dollar is stronger 
and then a lot of other ripple effects occur as well. But in general, a stronger dollar tightens financial conditions and makes it harder for the rest of the world. So there's a lot of eyes on the U.S. when these meetings go on or when people are reporting on them, so it seems. Absolutely. Well, all of these, all of these were really great, helpful pieces for people trying to put together their first Fed recap and try to understand it. Um, thank you for joining us. This was great. You had some great insights. My pleasure. Thanks a lot for having me and looking forward to coming on in the next IBKR podcasts. Sure. So as always, listeners can learn more about an array of financial topics for free at ibkrcampus.com. Follow us on your favorite podcast network and feel free to leave us a rating or review. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for listening to IBKR's Sense of Security. As always, there's more content at ibkrpodcast.com. And if you're interested in learning more about interactive brokers, visit ibkr.com. We offer more trading education content such as webinars, market commentary, market-related courses, and quant-related articles at ibkrcampus.com. The analysis in this material is provided for information only and is not and should not be construed as an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any security. To the extent that this material discusses general market activity, industry or sector trends or other broad-based economic or political conditions, it should not be construed as research or investment advice. To the extent that it includes references to specific securities, commodities, currencies, or other instruments, those references do not constitute a recommendation by IBKR to buy, sell, or hold such investments. This material does not and is not intended to take into account the particular financial conditions, investment objectives, or requirements of individual customers. Before acting on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and, as necessary, seek professional advice. Rates as of December 5, 2023. The mentioned rate applies exclusively to IBCare Pro clients. Positive settled cash balances held in the security segment of accounts with net asset value greater than 100000 earn the stated interest rate and those with net asset value less than 100000 earn a proportional rate. Cash held in the commodity segment of an account does not earn interest. Rates are subject to change.